Hi, everyone. Welcome to another exciting show with Home Buying Tips with Allie. Today, I am so happy to have my good friend here, Nick Meggs of Goosehead Insurance, and he has some amazing insurance tips for you. How are you doing today, Mick? I'm Nick? doing very well. <laughs> I'm doing very well, Allie. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I am uh, excited to be here and to um, just answer kind of some of the um, frequently asked questions that I get that I see uh, come up again, frequently with clients, and just some of the stuff that um, I feel like maybe folks um, should be a little bit more aware of kind of as they're going through the home buying process and then in the years beyond once you have your home. Right. And so you're, you're so young. Obviously, you've got this nice little baby face. How long have you been doing insurance? <laughs> so I'm older than I look. Um, I'm actually 37. So um, I have been doing insurance in different capacities with different companies for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll give you a, a real brief rundown. Um, I got started in individual health insurance, mm -hmm. and um, then obviously with some of the changes that happened in California, you know, roughly 10 years ago, um, that market was a little bit different, and so um, I got some more accreditation. Um, I got my licenses that let me do variable products and specialized in life insurance. Um, I worked for a company. Um, at that point, it was owned by MetLife. Um, since then, they've been bought and sold a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But um, so I did health insurance for about two years. I did life insurance for a couple of years. And then I actually um, transitioned into commercial insurance. And so I did uh, field risk management with um, commercial products uh, for a while. And then I've been back in the insurance game. I took a break for a little while. I've been back in the insurance game with the personal line side of it uh, for about a year and a half now. Wow. So um, I opened up a State Farm office uh, about a year and a half ago um, mm -hmm. and did that for just under a year and then decided that um, it was a great company and I really liked the opportunity. Mm -hmm. But I just felt that for the way that I wanted to do business with my clients and some of the things that I wanted to do in the community, um, going independent would be just a little bit better fit for me. Yeah, and you do amazing with being out there in the community. You and Gia, your partner in crime, are just <laughs> yeah. amazing out there. So. Thank you so much. So I wanted to ask you, what are the major coverage types on a typical homeowner's policy that everyone out there should know about? Sure. So um, I apologize, it's gonna get a little bit dry. I'll try to keep it entertaining. <laughs> um, and uh, just kind of a preface to all of this. So I always speak in generalities when we're talking about insurance. That's not because I'm trying to be vague. I just always want people to know a policy is not a policy is not a policy. Certain carriers handle things differently. Um, so I just always want folks to know, hey, when I'm speaking, it's, you know, in generalities. So really the, the big things are, I mean, the, the first one that everybody is going to think about, of course, is it's called your coverage A or the actual dwelling mm -hmm. coverage, right? So it's the amount of money that we set aside, generally speaking, for the actual structure, your home. Um, then with most carriers, what they do is they basically take that dollar figure, and let's say it's something nice and round, like $250,000. They take percentages of that, and they basically split that out and add additional amounts for kind of all the other stuff mm -hmm. in your house. So there's going to be um, your detached structures or your other structures coverage. Um, most frequently in an urban setting like this, what we're looking at there is gazebos, swimming pools, fences. Mm -hmm. That's what that's going to cover. Um, if you're a little bit more rural like we have in the foothills, um, I grew up out near Prather. So then you need to be a little bit more concerned about that coverage because now we're talking about maybe pump houses. Um, we're talking about, you know, barns, things like that. So you need to be a little bit more aware of it. Um, your personal property coverage, this is your stuff is the easiest way to think of that. Mm -hmm. um, an adage that I heard a long time ago that has kind of stuck with me is if you pick your house up and you shake it, everything that falls out, that's going to be your coverage C stuff, your personal property. Um, now, I always caution people that there are some sublimits on this. So just because you have, let's say, 125000 in personal property coverage, that doesn't mean that that's going to apply the same way to collectibles, antiques, jewelry. There are some things in there that it's going to be a little bit limited to. Right. But for the most part, if we're talking about purses, clothes, um, your sofa, um, minor electronics like your TV, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, you basically have you know, this kind of blanket amount for all that stuff. Now, I understand with those types of policies that sometimes homeowners have a policy that's a replacement at old cost versus yeah. replacement with today's cost for those items. Yep. So can you educate us more on that? For sure. And um, that's an excellent question. Thankfully, in California particularly, almost any major carrier that you go with, and again, I you know, kind of put an asterisk next to that, but almost any major carrier that you go with is going to be what we call replacement cost. Mm -hmm. So replacement cost essentially means you contact the insurance company if you've had a loss. So let's say it's a theft, right? And we're just going to exclude the deductible from this conversation. We're just going to talk about like regular numbers right. here. So let's say somebody broke into your house and you say, hey, they um, 
strong thief. He carried out my six hundred or my six thousand dollar leather couch just out the front door, right? And it does happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so you say, mm -hmm. "Hey, I would like six thousand dollars, please." What the company is going to do if it's replacement cost is they say, "Cool, your couch was six thousand dollars. Here's a six thousand dollar check." Obviously, we're leaving the deductible out. Now, if it's actual cash value, what they're going to do is they're going to take a look at it and they're going to say, "Great." That was a really nice $6,000 leather couch that you bought 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. We're going to go ahead and factor in depreciation for that. So now instead of it being $6,000, maybe it's $2,800. So they're, right. mm -hmm. so they're basically going to give you the money to go buy those same items used, essentially. Right. Um, I rarely, rarely see that written, thankfully. Um, mm -hmm. It is one of those options that's out there with certain carriers because sometimes I've had folks say, um, you know, I just want to keep the premium down. That can keep it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a secondary home or a seasonal home, and they say, hey, I don't really have that much stuff there, and I'm not really attached to it. So if something were to happen, that's fine. You know, let me save the extra 80 or 90 bucks a year because really all that I have up there is my fishing gear that I leave. Right. But, yeah, that's an excellent question, and it's something that I always stress with my clients. Make sure that you at least know the difference and then make your own decision at exactly. that point. Exactly. Now, you did mention the, the D word quite a few times, deductibles. <laughs> yeah. So how do deductibles actually work? And right. I understand a lot of people don't even realize that they have a deductible and how much they have in place. Yeah. So this is one of those that is going to vary um, not only carrier by carrier, but sometimes even within your same policy, depending on what items are lost, mm -hmm. there's going to be a different deductible there. Generally speaking, what's going to happen is... Um, and in California, particularly, we usually have just an all perils deductible, mm -hmm. which basically just means, hey, if you have a loss for something that's covered, right? So let's say a fire or a theft, what's going to happen? And $1,000 is kind of the standard. It started to creep up a little bit more over the years just because two reasons, really. One is insurance companies basically wanted to kind of protect clients from filing really low dollar claims where maybe, you know, you got $200 from the insurance company, but now you lost one of your um, no claims discounts. And we can get into that a little bit more later. Um, but they really felt like, hey, most of the losses that we're seeing that are, you know, eight or $900, it probably isn't in anybody's best interest for us to file that claim. Let's go ahead and default the deductible to like $2,000. Right. Um, but that being said, 1,000 is still kind of the standard that I see in California. Mm -hmm. um, that's just what a lot of carriers default to. So what's gonna happen in that situation is, let's say there's a fire and you've lost some items. It's not a total loss, but it's something minor. Basically, you're going to go to the insurance company and say, hey, I have $10,000 worth of stuff. And they're going to say, okay, great. You did a good job and your policy is written at replacement cost. What we're going to do is just withhold that deductible amount and we're going to cut you a check for $9,000. Right. So it's not something that you have to pay out of pocket. Mm -hmm. um, it's just something they're going to withhold from the settlement. Oh, that's nice. Now, for certain other um, coverage types, like let's say if we're looking at you know, jewelry or something like that, where there's a lower sublimit, where maybe the policy only covers $1,500 worth of jewelry, Frequently, what some carriers will do is say, hey, your deductible is $1,000, except for this particular coverage, since you only have you know, $1,500 in coverage here, mm -hmm. maybe the deductible here is only $500 or $250. Right. So it's going to vary a little bit, but generally speaking, you're looking at roughly $1,000 that's going to apply to a loss. Yeah, and normally. someone can pick which deductible they prefer, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So carriers have a whole bunch of different options. Um, some companies are going to let you go all the way down to $0 deductible or $100 deductible. Um, some, they're going to kind of start you off at like $2,000. Or, and in California, you don't see this too often. It's much bigger in Texas and in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. But they'll just do a percentage where they say, hey, we're going to take that $250,000 for your house. One percentage of that is going to be your deductible. So you've got a $2,500 deductible in that okay. scenario. We don't see that too much out here, but some policies do have that as an option. Well, since we're talking about policies, yeah. a lot of people think that a homeowner's policy is a homeowner's policy. Are all right. policies the same? They are not. So... Um, without getting into kind of a qualitative thing where I talk about which I think are better and which I think are worse, because it, it completely varies client to client and their individual needs. Mm -hmm. But all policies are not the same. So really, you're going to see a general framework for most homeowners policies in California where the contract was written up by the carrier and sent over to the Department of Insurance. And the Department of Insurance takes a look at it and says, yep, this seems viable. You've got kind of everything in there that we feel is appropriate. You're not trying to put one over on the client. Right. That's fine. You can go ahead and write this. Now, within that, carriers are going to tinker a little bit. Mm -hmm. So maybe one carrier has had really bad experiences with dog bites in the past. So maybe they're going to step in and say, hey, animal liability is excluded from this policy unless you basically endorse it. And an endorsement is just something that you can add back into the policy. Mm -hmm. So you can essentially say, hey, you know what? Um, I have a Labrador. I don't think he's going to bite anybody. But just to be safe, let's go ahead and pay the extra, let's say, 20 bucks a year to mm -hmm. go ahead and add that back in. 
Um, so different policies are going to have different exclusions. They're going to have different endorsements. Um, some of them are going to let you add some cool stuff. Like um, one that I've seen that's, that's fairly new is um, coverage for interruption in alternative energy sources. Oh, wow. So, solar. Exactly. So if you have mm -hmm. solar panels and your solar panels are damaged, let's say there's a fire again, right. right? And your solar panels are damaged. Well, all of a sudden now your electrical bill goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. Well, this particular carrier offers some coverage for that. So they're basically going to step in and say, hey, for the next couple of months while we get your solar up and running again, here's you know X amount of money up to the limit to help you pay for your electrical bills. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, so there are some bells and whistles out there that people are kind of tinkering with all the time. And um, Airbnb is actually another one that I've seen a lot of. Carriers aren't really sure how to handle that yet. So some of them basically just say, hey, if anything happens while you have an Airbnb tenant, we're not going to cover it. Some of them say, hey, you let us know and you have X number of days per year that you can have tenants and we're going to go ahead and cover it. And maybe there's a little bit of a surcharge on the policy. Hmm. Okay. Well, one that I'm very particular about and I, I am very fond of is the earthquake insurance. Yeah. We live in California. Yep. Only guarantee in life is death and taxes, and we cannot predict those earthquakes. <laughs> so how does earthquake insurance work? Yeah. So um, earthquake insurance is a little bit of a, a different animal here in California than it is in some other states because we're in California, mm -hmm. right? So there's a higher earthquake risk here than there is in, say, Oklahoma. Right. So... Generally speaking, your homeowner's policy is going to exclude what they consider earth movement. Mm -hmm. So that's going to include mudslides and earthquake is the one that people are, are generally most worried about. A few different ways you can kind of add that back in. Some carriers will offer limited earthquake insurance as an endorsement. Mm -hmm. So you can basically say, yep, on my policy, I'd like to pay you know X amount more. And I want you to just kind of roll coverage in for that on my standard homeowner's policy. A lot of companies are going to say, we're not getting involved in that. You can go outside of it. Now, there's two ways that you can do that. One is through the California Earthquake Authority. Now, the CEA is a government-funded organization because basically all the carriers went to the Department of Insurance and said, hey, if there's you know, a 7.0 earthquake in Los Angeles, we can't afford to cover that. Right. You know, even a, a huge company, it just we're looking at billions and billions of dollars, we wouldn't be able to pay out claims. Mm -hmm. So the state of California stepped in and basically said, cool, we'll go ahead and set up a government-sponsored fund where people can go and get earthquake insurance. The policies are pretty flexible. Um, they're honestly, they're really well put together. Mm -hmm. um, there are some limitations in those. Now, since it is a government funded organization, they are not ever going to tell you that you are not, well, let me take that back. I don't like to use absolutes. There aren't like particular zip codes that they're gonna say, hey, you're not eligible for that here. Even if there are earthquakes happening in your area, the CEA is not ever gonna freeze enrollment. Mm -hmm. They're basically gonna say, hey, we're open for business, go ahead and enroll. Right. Now, if you have something unusual, maybe you have a higher dollar home or there's some particular coverage types that you really want that aren't offered in the CEA policy, there are some private carriers in California, just individual companies that will go ahead and take uh, earthquake insurance on. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that you will run into there is they don't generally exclude by zip codes where they just say, we're never gonna write a policy there. But what might happen is like earlier in the year when we had a pretty decent amount of earthquake activity, right. certain carriers let me know, hey, for the time being, we aren't, the private carriers, we aren't taking on new earthquake clients in these areas, basically until everything settles down and we can kind of figure out what's going on. So then two or three weeks later, they sent all of their agents an email and just said, hey, we're good. We can kind of open up business there again. Right. So that won't happen with the CEA, but there are a few more options out there on the private market. It's like looking at health insurance. It's like a pre-existing condition when the soil's actively moving, they don't want to endorse at that moment. Yeah, that's one way to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what they really are trying to do, because what insurance is all about on the carrier side is kind of matching premium to risk, mm -hmm. right? They want to make sure, and the DOI regulates this very closely, so I know people feel like they get ripped off on their insurance all the time. Um, I know some carriers are more expensive than others, but I do let you know that the Department of Insurance monitors that very closely, and carriers do have to go to the DOI and basically justify what their rates are. They mm -hmm. have to say, hey, we brought this much money in, we paid this much money out. For us to stay solvent, this is what our rates need to look like. Okay. And so that's part of the reason that companies pay attention to things like earthquake activity is they say, hey, for our existing clients, we want to make sure that we can properly kind of match cost and risk here. So once everything settles down, we get a better idea of what our losses were, what this looks like. We can better model that for everybody. Awesome. Well, I do know that sometimes people are looking for homes and um, they are actually in flood zones. Yeah. And that requires a different type of insurance. So can you touch on the flood insurance for us? Sure. And we run into that um, a pretty decent amount in some of the more rural communities um, in Fresno, I know, or in the Central Valley, at mm -hmm. least. I know that I've seen a few, um, you know, kind of out in Hanford in those areas Portland. that are a little bit, yep, yes. a little bit more prone mm -hmm. to flooding. Um, so flood insurance is available to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you can always get it. Now, 
whether or not, you know, if you're at, I don't know, Sean Blackstone, you probably don't really feel like you need flood insurance. Right. And you can check, uh, FEMA will actually have what they consider a flood zone map, right? So, I mean, you can do this yourself. You don't even need an insurance agent to do it, but you can basically go get a flood zone determination where mm -hmm. they say, hey, you're in zone X. X means, according to FEMA, there's very little risk of a flood zone right. or a flood happening. Now, that's not always the case. People are surprised, and um, there's a statistic out there um, that I should have looked up that tells you the percentage of flood claims that happen in a, a flood zone X, because mm -hmm. they do still happen, so it's not a guarantee. Mm -hmm. But um, basically, what's going to happen is you are only required to have flood insurance if you are in a high-risk flood zone. Mm -hmm. They will disclose that to you during the home buying process, and generally, your mortgagee, your bank, is going to say, we're not closing this unless you have a flood policy. Right. So very similar to the earthquake policy, there is uh, the National Flood Insurance Program through FEMA, where that's government sponsored. Those policies are a little bit less flexible. Um, they have some coverage caps because they're basically there for folks that can't get flood insurance through a private carrier or, um, yeah, basically just to make sure that you can close your, your home, right? They're not necessarily there to make sure that if there's a flood, everything is replaced exactly the same way it was to full value. That's not necessarily what they're there for. Right. Um, some of the private carriers will do that. Now, the private carriers will be a there little bit more... There's a fly in here. Right? <laughs> I'm, he's fascinated, too. I guess he wants to hear more about it. His little fly house. Um, some of the private carriers will have some restrictions, like, hey, we're not going to do manufactured homes, things like that. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be the case on the NFIP side. The NFIP is not going to turn you away. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really what's going to be going on there is in certain areas, you have to have it. It's available to everybody. And then there's the government program and a few private carriers that you're going to be looking at that have some kind of different bells and whistles that they can roll in there. Now, sometimes I hear people say, oh, you don't want a house in the flood zone because it's flood insurance is so expensive. Is right. it really a big number? So again, this is going to be one of those that it really depends on exactly how you want your policy to, to be set up. Mm -hmm. What, because there's even within like a high risk flood zone, there's still kind of different tiers of that, right? Um, but then really, what do you want your policy to do for you when a flood happens? If we're looking at something that's just catastrophic, like, you know, if we get like a biblical flood and my house just disappears, I really want the $200,000 to rebuild the house. I'll pay for the stuff out of pocket. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but for some folks, you know, again, if it's a secondary home, they don't have stuff there, they're good with that. Yeah. Um, that's obviously gonna be less expensive. Now, um, some folks say, hey, I basically, I want like the same thousand dollar deductible that I have on my home. I want the same types of coverages. I want, if a flood happens, I want all my stuff replaced exactly like it is today. That can be prohibitively expensive for some people. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, but that can get a little bit more expensive. Um, I don't ever like to throw out numbers, you know, without having a better of idea of the risk. But um, you need the address, you need everything. Yeah, I pretty frequently, if we're talking about, you know, let's say a roughly average home, right, like a quarter million dollar home um, in a higher risk flood zone, you're probably looking at your flood insurance being roughly the same as your homeowner's policy. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, like I know just an, a particular example, I wrote a policy that it was about $600 on the homeowner's insurance for a well put together policy. It was about $750 for the flood insurance for again, a very well put together policy mm -hmm. because I spoke to this client and they said, Nope, I want to make sure if something happens, you replace everything. Right. So there's quite a bit of variation on the flood and the earthquake policies that you won't necessarily see on a homeowner's policy because they're just more flexible by nature. What do you want it to do? Exactly. Well, awesome. Well, we are going to take a quick break. When we come back, we have more insurance tips with Nick Meggs of Goosehead Insurance. When you need to get fit, contact Gary Torres, IFBB Pro. Email GaryTorres5336 at yahoo.com. Hey, I'm Chris DeVold. Tune in every Friday night on CentralValleyTalk.com when I bring you Sex, Drugs, Chris DeVold, where I'll give you three guesses on what we talk about. And I also vow to bring you one live local music act a week. So tune in every week because you never know what kind of music you're going to hear right here on CentralValleyTalk.com. The Space Colony Journals are an epic tale of a family struggle to survive. Meet the courageous women and dangerous men who dare to carve a home on the alien world of Vensug. Get your copy today. Available on Amazon and Gail Daly's FineArt.com.
You enter this door with expired tags. Beyond is another dimension, a dimension of regulations, a dimension of long waits. You have reached the registration zone. What looks like an ordinary shop is actually Mitchell Smog, located in the heart of the Tower District, a few minutes from the DMV. Mitchell Smog offers your vehicle a star certified smog inspection. So remember Mitchell Smog when you need to pass through the registration zone. Contact Sarah Hernandez of June and Matt Photography to schedule your portrait, engagement, wedding, or next family photo session. But that's not all. Sarah is also your personal brandographer, helping you ditch the stock photos and get images that sell. Call 559-412-3721. Visit JuneAndMattPhoto.com and follow Sarah on Instagram and Facebook. Hello everyone, my name is Miss G. I offer fun and affordable promotion and advertisement on my talk show. It is called Fresno Vibes. We talk, we play awesome music. I also feature a bunch of different bartenders from different places. I like to have restaurants, I like to have any event, any kind of fun stuff. Contact me at rmgmissg at gmail.com and we will have so much fun and we will Promote your business, promote your event right here on my show. So contact me. We'll have fun. Thank you. Give your child the tools to succeed. The Yergubian Academic Center offers one-on-one -on -one and group educational lessons by appointment. Over 90% of our students show significant improvement in their academics in just three months. Students of the Yergubian Academic Center have gone on to UCLA, UC San Diego, Yale, Stanford, and many more prestigious universities. Schedule a tutoring session today. Call 559-437-3973. Are you thinking of selling your home? Since 2004, the Sousa Group, brokered by eXp Realty, has specialized in premier property listings and sales located in the Clovis Unified and North Fresno markets. The Sousa Group will do their best to exceed your expectations. Visit ClovisUnifiedHomes.com. If your home floods, who will you call? When your house springs a leak, it's time to call Clean Master Emergency Flood Service at 559-213-9430. Clean Master will be there in 60 minutes to start fixing your home. And Clean Master bills your insurance directly, saving you the hassle because you've got enough to worry about. Clean Master also offers carpet and upholstery cleaning, carpet repair, pet odor removal, and more. Remember, Clean Master Emergency Flood Service. 559-213-9430 and visit cleanmasterflood.com Pour yourself a glass of crybaby wine available at the market and Sam's Italian Deli and remember to ask for crybaby wine at your favorite restaurant. the higher good of food, right? You're growing a product that people enjoy really all over the world. I mean, how does that make you feel? I think about that all the time. I think about the families uh, sitting around a, a table enjoying a meal. I, I just see that what we do brings families together. I mean, we're blessed. We're, we're in paradise for, for food. Kern Family of the Kern Family Farm invites you to eat delicious, nutritious, organic produce available at the Gnarly Carrot. Located at 32954 Road 222 in North Fork, California, the Gnarly Carrot is a local, natural, seasonally changing market offering a wide range of products from local Central Valley vendors. Get your caffeine fix, grab a smoothie, and support small businesses. Learn more at kernfamilyfarm.com and visit the Gnarly Carrot today. Hi everyone, welcome back to Home Buying Tips with Allie. I'm here with Nick Meggs of Goosehead Insurance. 
And Nick's been giving us some awesome tips about insurance and some really great insight. And so, Nick, I think the ladies might be more concerned with this next question. Okay. So, are my antiques, collectibles, and jewelry covered? Yeah, so this is one of those things that I think this may be more than any other um, coverage item when I start talking to folks. This is the one that can kind of sneak up and surprise people sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to go ahead and put this. I think that some of the fault is also with the insured in this situation because the best insurance agent in the world, we can only really insure what we know you have, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're basically, you know, we're looking at property information from Zillow or for the county assessor's office. We're having a conversation with you. Well, if you happen to have an antique pearl necklace, I don't know that unless you tell me. Right. Um, so that being said, don't ever feel like the information that you give to an insurance agent is not useful. Mm -hmm. um, if they grumble about it, that's on them, not on you. You can't give me too much information. I might not write it down and think like, okay, I don't really need to know that. Whatever, I'll just file that to the side. Right. But every once in a while, there's something that I'll pick up that I say, hey, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because that means I can better help protect you. Exactly. Now, most policies are going to have much lower sublimits for things like jewelry or collectibles than they do for like your furniture. Mm -hmm. So you might frequently see, hey, we're gonna cover $1,500 worth of jewelry for a single loss, that's it. If you have a $20,000 Rolex, we're gonna give you 1500 bucks for it. Mm -hmm. There's a few different ways that you can kind of get around that. So most policies will let you do what they call scheduling. When you schedule on a policy, you basically say, hey, I have um, a diamond ring that you know, my grandma gave to me. It's worth $14,000. Obviously it's irreplaceable, but I went and I got it appraised. Great, what your insurance agent is gonna do is say, cool, send me over a recent appraisal. And recent means different things to different carriers, right? But go ahead and send me over a recent appraisal that kind of details everything for the ring. What I'm gonna do is go ahead and make sure that that's covered. Mm -hmm. So then we basically, and there, there is an additional cost to it, but we go ahead and put kind of a line item on the policy that says, hey, here's all the other regular coverages. Also, grandma's engagement ring is on here and it's covered for $14,000, whether it's stolen, burned, or, you know, if you go swimming and that ring just comes off and you don't know where it is, it's called mysterious disappearance. Mm -hmm. Generally, it's gonna extend coverage in those situations wow. as well. There are some carriers also, um, like Jewelers International, and I know there's another out there, that that's literally all they do mm -hmm. is they write jewelry insurance. Um, it's cool because they have some more flexibility, but if you don't feel like going through another company and you just say, hey, I just want it on my homeowner's policy, great. Most homeowner's policies, we can just go ahead and put it on your homeowner's that's policy. That's awesome, that's awesome. So when it comes to insurance, yep. because a lot of people are either misguided or they don't take the time to look. They just sign for anything, <laughs> which it happens. Oh, yeah. Um, what are some of the common mistakes that you see when it comes to policies? Yeah. Um, and again, some of these are going to be, I think, just because an agent didn't do their due diligence. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are going to be because folks, um, and there's, there's nothing wrong with going online. There are some really good online uh, insurance providers now. Um, just to name drop a few, I'm not promoting them by any means. I'm just saying you might be familiar with something like Lemonade or Hippo or Bamboo. They're mm -hmm. fairly recent. Um, so that's becoming a market. You know, for years and years, people have been used to, oh, hey, I'll go online and I'll get my auto insurance. Not so much with homeowner's insurance. Right. That's fairly recent. Um, so maybe somebody just went on and they weren't really comfortable putting it together, but they basically picked, hey, give me an option that looks good for me, and they didn't really do some research. Or maybe, like I said before, the insured just didn't convey that information to the insurance mm -hmm. agent. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, a couple of the kind of problem areas that I see are, just like I said, with any kind of unusual personal property, right? So that could be, is it an expensive instrument? Um, even an artificial limb, believe it or not, those can be covered uh, prosthetics, but oh, we nice. need to know. Um, is it, you know, expensive camera equipment, right? Like, mm -hmm. do you have a setup at home? Something like that. Um, one of the other ones that I see frequently, particularly when we start to get a little bit more rural, is, like I mentioned earlier, the other structures coverage. Um, I have reviewed a few policies where I'm looking at a home that's on a couple of acres that has a swimming pool, it has a finished barn, um, it has a workshop. You know, we've got three or four other buildings there, and that's not that uncommon when you're out in the foothills. And I take a look. Well, the policy is basically written like... It was an urban policy. Mm -hmm. So we see the other structures coverage is still just 10% of that primary dwelling piece. So I'm looking at it and I say, hey, we've got $40,000 to cover two acres worth of fencing and three or four outbuildings. Right. Probably not a good idea. Exactly. So, and that could even be something that when the policy was originally written, those buildings weren't there, but just nobody ever contacted the insurance agent. Mm -hmm. And as much as I try to stay in touch with my clients, I do think it's probably a bad idea for me to call you every day and go, hey, what'd you build in the backyard today? <laughs> so um, those are some of the oversights that I see is the personal property coverage and um, just other structures. That, that's pretty common. Okay. 
Um, and then what, what are some of the factors that can affect our homeowner premium? Right. Um, everybody always wants the lowest amount you can pay for your homeowner's insurance mm -hmm. policy, right? Like, I don't like to say cheap. You want the most affordable policy. Right. Totally get that. There's no reason for you to overpay. Um, same token, you can kind of go underpay on that. But some of the things that will impact your premiums, you can control. Mm -hmm. Some of them you really can't. So the big one, the first one that's going to come up is really your particular carrier's loss experiences in that area, mm -hmm. right? So um, it's gotten a lot more granular now. Um, as data has gotten more available and there's more advanced computer modeling and things like that, a lot of companies are getting much more specific as far as what they want their rates to be in a certain area, you know, down to the zip code, down to, you know, that side of the street kind right. of data, right? So that's going to be the first thing is they're going to take a look at, hey, we've had a ton of water losses in this area. Um, we just need to increase our premiums in this particular area. Mm -hmm. You can't really do anything about that. Right. That's just where your house is. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that you can do something about that are going to impact your premiums are um, arguably your loss history, right? So almost all carriers are either going to hit you with a surcharge or just say we're not going to take your policy at all if you've had some losses in the last three or five years. So being really careful about what you file a claim for is kind of the way that you can contribute to that. I totally get if your home burns down, file a claim. That's what it's there for. Mm -hmm. No insurance agent should ever tell a client not to file a claim, but what they should do is give you an educated idea of what it's going to look like as far as what you're going to get paid out for that particular type of claim. And again, they're not going to extend coverage, but they can let you know, hey, if it's a jewelry loss, I'm looking right now and you only have $1,500 in coverage for jewelry, right. so that's the max we're going to pay out, right? Um, and they'll let you know what your deductible looks like and then also at least let you know, hey, Realistically, we're looking at before I get more information. You know, maybe you had, um, you know, a certain deductible and fifteen hundred dollars worth of loss. You're going to get paid out five hundred dollars on this mm -hmm. particular loss. Is that worth it to you? Because that is going to technically go down as a loss. So that's something you can do. Just be a little bit more heady about what claims you file and make sure that it's really worth it to you. Exactly. Because um, there are a lot of frivolous claims being submitted every day. Yeah. And, you know, one of the ones that really breaks my heart is it's not necessarily frivolous, but, you know, I'll take a look and I see, I mean, I've seen policies where there's $180 claim paid out for theft. And I take a look and for this, you know, the particular carrier they're with, maybe that waived a $250 a year um, claims free discount. Right. And, you know, that can be three or five years depending on the carrier. And it's like, well, you got 180 bucks out of that after the deductible. Now, again, no insurance agent, I feel, should ever tell their client, do not file a claim. But I feel most folks, if they had that conversation with an agent and the agent said, hey, this is likely what's going to get paid out based on the numbers that you're giving me, I feel like most of them probably would have walked away and said, hey, I'm not thrilled with it. I'll pay the 180 bucks out of pocket. Exactly. Yeah. So is there a way to lower our existing premiums? Yeah. So there's a few different things you can do. I mean, obviously, shopping around is one way, right? But just assuming that you're staying with the same carrier and you say, hey, I've had a good experience with them. I like my agent, you know, whatever it is, I'm comfortable here. What are some things that I can do to maybe bring this down without limiting your coverages? Because that's obviously the easiest one, right? It's like, hey, let's just crank the deductible up. Mm -hmm. um, removing some things like that. One of the things that a lot of carriers give discounts for, and it's going to vary based on the percentage, is what they call a package discount or bundling discount, right? So you're familiar with that. If you write your home and your auto and maybe even earthquake and umbrella policy, like some different things like that with the same carrier, frequently they'll have discounts that apply kind of differently across the policy lines. Right. So for some carriers, I mean, it can even be, you know, a 15, 20% discount on your home if you write the car with them. So that might be worth it. Um, one of the other ones that I see frequently is security system. Mm -hmm. A security system, and again, it's going to depend on the carrier and kind of everything else going on with the policy. Um, you know, I've seen anywhere from like 25 bucks a year to a couple hundred dollars a year, it's going to lower the premium. Right. Um, and I mean, that's something that a lot of folks want to have anyway. Especially today. Right. <laughs> and I've had a lot of clients that had it that didn't realize that there was a discount for them. So mm -hmm. I just in casual conversation say, by the way, do you have this? And they go, yeah, I have, you know, a monitored alarm system. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and save me 150 bucks a year and kind of help pay for that. Um, those are kind of the, the two big ones that I see. Um, some of the things that folks don't realize there are some discounts for because it varies so much carrier to carrier mm -hmm. is some carriers give a big, big discount if you're in a gated community. You can't really control that once you buy the house, but let your insurance agent know, hey, I'm in a gated community. Um, we have a neighborhood watch. Uh, sometimes even your occupation, some carriers will say, hey, we really, really like engineers. Um, if you graduated from Fresno State or any accredited school or if you're an engineer or if you're a member of the Shriners, things like that, just let your insurance agent know, you know, a little bit of stuff about that. And just even ask, hey, I'm with this carrier. What discounts might be available to me? Oh, that's awesome to know because yeah. people don't even think about that. 
I didn't know until I started writing with multiple companies and I was kind of digging through a couple of them and I thought, like, why in the world on this application does it ask if this person is an engineer? And then I took a look and I said, oh, okay, cool, because they offer an X percentage discount for an engineer as long as you can provide a copy of your diploma. Cool, wow. I'll start asking people. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so when should I start looking for homeowner's insurance when I'm purchasing my home? I mean, the easiest answer is as soon as possible, mm -hmm. right? The earlier, the better. Um, most agents are not going to be so busy during the day that if you call and you just explain, hey, I'm looking at this home. I haven't gone into escrow yet, but I think this is the one. Can you give me a quote? Mm -hmm. They will usually do that for you. Right. Um, I know I will. All the folks that I know in the industry will. Because um, you can't close escrow unless you have an insurance policy in place. Correct. Yeah. And so normally they're going to give you an idea. And if you take a look at it and you say, hey, that seems reasonable, cool, you already got this piece of the shopping done, like you can move on with the rest of your process. If you feel like, hey, that's way too high, cool, now you have some time to go look at some other options. Mm -hmm. um, what, especially if you're in what some folks would consider kind of a higher risk area, right? Mm -hmm. Like again, if you're out because of the wildfires, there have been some huge changes in the way companies are looking and underwriting things in California. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you're what you wouldn't really consider to be super, super rural, right? like if you're in Prather, that's not that far out there by most people's standards. Well, things have changed a little bit now compared to five years ago when you look for your homeowner's insurance. Oh, yeah. So you might need a little bit more time to really get an understanding of, hey, what does it look like on this home for my insurance? And I mean, there have been cases where I've been working with a real estate agent and a loan officer and they say, you know what, for this particular client, we just can't get an insurance policy under X amount. That's a deal breaker for them. Like mm -hmm. they just don't have that in their budget because of their debt to income ratio or whatever the setup was. Exactly. That's why I encourage people to get started on it earlier because that's going to give you a better idea of, you know, I know it would be terrible to walk away from your dream home because of an insurance risk. It would be much better to do that earlier in the process than mm -hmm. once you go through all the heartache and you get set up and you have a move in date and all you need is that insurance agents get a number over to you and they say, hey, $3,500 a year. Yep. And you just can't swing that. And you released all your contingencies and. There you go. Right. That's yeah. why I always let people know, like, hey, basically, once you have an address, I pretty much need, like, name, birthday, and an address, and I can give you a really specific quote on that mm -hmm. property. And then you've got that in your back pocket. If it goes through, great. If not, it took 10 minutes for both of us to get it in place. Exactly. Not a big deal. Exactly. Well, we're going to be back after a few minutes, and stay tuned for more. Hi everyone, I am Sparkle Sujin with the Everything Sparkle Show. Tune in every Thursday live at 4 p.m. You will see people that are motivational, inspirational, inspiring, and of course, entertaining. We have a great time. We'll learn things about how big celebrities are inspiring big names here in Fresno. Hugh Hefner is the reason we have Fresno Magazine and Gnarly Charlie got his start because Johnny Carson told him to. So, tune in, you'll learn something new and have a good time. Visit the beautiful city of Exeter and visit ExeterChamber.com. The Chamber's mission is to promote, support, and enable Exeter to prosper, creating a strong local economy, promoting community, and providing networking opportunities. Follow the Chamber on Facebook and Twitter or give the Chamber a call at 559-592-2919. Call Peachy's Catering for all your special occasions. Available to cook any variety of foods and desserts that will leave your taste buds wanting more. Call 559-558-2682 and follow Peachy's on Instagram and Facebook. Is everything in life draining you? Come to Stretch 360. Our professional staff can offer you many options for relaxation like deep tissue or hot stone massages, infrared medical grade sauna. Once you leave us, you'll look and feel like a million bucks. Stretch 360. Relaxation is only a stretch away. Call Nicole Hamilton McManus at 559-917-3040 to buy this perfect, romantic, rustic ranch with a two-home setup. Located only 12 miles from the entrance to Kings Canyon and Sequoia National Park, this beautifully maintained property boasts of amenities and custom features. 
The main home is a three-bedroom, one-bath, 1,670 square feet. The guest home is two bedrooms, one bath, with 1,163 square feet. Also features a 75-foot lap pool, a cabana, a beautiful garden, and two small nearby ponds. Call Nicole Hamilton McManus at 559-917-3040. The Art of Becoming, Who We Are in Christ by Jolene Kennedy is a book about the process of maturity as we find our true identity since God's promises must be received, embraced, and activated within us. Get your copy today and check out JoleneKennedy.com. Fleet Feet Fresno is more than just a running and sportswear store. Fleet Feet Sports mission is to provide runners and other active Fresnans with gear that fits their individual needs, training that helps them reach their fitness goals, and races that satisfy their competitive spirit. Get to know Fleet Feet Fresno today. Central Valley Talk. Hi everyone, welcome back to Home Buying Tips with Allie. I am here with Nick <coughs> Meggs of Goosehead Insurance. He's been giving us some amazing tips on insurance and his mother is actually watching us live <laughs> right now. So you have to say hi to your mom. Hi mom. <laughs> so I am dying to know this. I have not refinanced my house, but yeah. I've been thinking about it. If I refinance my house, should I review my insurance or am I okay to leave my current policy as is? Yeah. So, I mean, you obviously the refinancing piece of it is not going to change anything as far as your coverage needs, right? As long as your policy was set up properly before, that's not really going to change here unless you're, you know, refinancing to do renovations or something like right. that. But if we're just looking at lowering a rate, not too concerned about that. But I think it is a great time to take a look at your policy because I find that a lot of folks will kind of more aggressively price shop or more frequently shop at least their auto insurance because you're writing a check for it or you know it's coming out of your bank statement every month you're aware of that like you feel that hit mm -hmm. um, most folks have their homeowner's insurance tied to their mortgage it's right. just escrowed so your mortgage fluctuates a little bit especially if you're on a variable interest rate all right you just chalk it up to whatever right like mm -hmm. you don't really take a look at it and go hey my my homeowner's insurance went up 23 percent in the last couple of years until you get maybe maybe you take a look at the renewal notice or maybe you see an insurance company's name and you go Ugh, and you just throw that in the trash like a lot of people do i look at mine i'm on mine <laughs> well, <laughs> but not everyone look at your like industry that. though yeah. right like yeah of course you're more aware of bills than most people um so for a lot of folks if they haven't taken a look at that i mean i've worked with clients that they say hey i haven't looked at my homeowner's insurance in 10 years and we take a look and i go hey there have been some innovations in that time there have been some new carriers that have come into california there have been some folks that have radically readjusted their rates there are some new coverages out there there's a lot of cool stuff for us to take a look at and i mean there have been times that we've taken somebody and um, there was one client that we went from again I, I don't like to throw numbers out there but of course um it was high and um they just happened to be with a company whose rates were very competitive 10 years ago and that company has suffered some really bad losses over the last you know half decade or so and so just their rates have crept up quite a bit so we took a look and i said hey i can offer you a comparable policy with one of like four other carriers that's going to be roughly half of what you're paying right now because that's a great company they've just had it rough for a few years yeah the only reason that those people ever took a look at that was because they were refinancing and they basically their debt to income ratio like you're never more I, I don't think you're never more aware of your credit and your financial situation than you are when any sort of a home transaction is involved. Oh, of course. Right, like that kind of brings everything out into the light. And that's exactly what happened here is the LO that they were working with was shrewd enough to take a look and go, hey, by the way, since we're doing this to lower your mortgage, let's take a look at one of the big things that's contributing to your mortgage. Let's go ahead and get that lowered. So I always encourage people to take a look. Um, and I, I try to tell people to review their policy annually. Even if you pull it up, you take a look, you talk to your agent for five minutes and you go, nothing's changed, we're good cool, at least now you know that you're good. Mm -hmm. But I've had clients that have called me because they're doing a refi. And as we're talking about it, they go, oh yeah, by the way, you know, we built that 2,000 square foot shed last year. I didn't know about that. I need to know about that. Let's make some changes. So um, yeah, I think if you're refinancing, it's the perfect time to just go ahead and take a look because you've got everything out in front of you. You know what your budget's going to be. You know what your mortgage is going to be going forward. Right. Let's do it. Well, and that's one thing that you mentioned right now was, um, was renovations because mm -hmm. I believe a lot of people they'll remodel their kitchen, their bathroom, they'll add something on, but they never call you right. and let you know that it was done. So yep. how much does that affect them Yeah, should something happen and they're not properly covered? 
and I totally get it. Calling your insurance agent is like the worst thing in the world, right? Like going to the DMV might be worse, but that's about the only thing that most folks would rather do less than call their insurance the agent. Dentist. dentist is pretty bad too. No <laughs> offense to the dentists out there. You guys do a great job. Yes. Gals too. Um, but, uh, you know, really it's one of those things that generally it's going to be pretty minor if we're talking about like, hey, I put in granite countertops mm -hmm. because most of the time your insurance company is basically just looking at what do we feel the replacement cost of the entire home is, right? right. Granite countertops, I mean, it, it might increase it you know, two or $3,000, maybe more than that. But usually in the, the grand scheme of things on your home, when we're talking about a $350,000 policy, mm -hmm. we probably had a little bit of room for error. You should still call your agent and let them know, but it's probably not going to be, you know, a huge change. They might even enter it into the system and the replacement cost estimator that they use. Um, because what most carriers have is basically a system where you plug in, hey, here's the square footage, here's the year of the build, here's some details about the home, you know, the flooring, the overall build quality, and the system's basically gonna spit out a number that says, we feel like in your area right now, it would cost X amount to rebuild this home from the ground up. Mm -hmm. So they'll go in there and update that, and frequently, two or $3,000 change there is not even gonna make any changes on the premium. Now, one thing that I do see, and we were talking about this a little bit during the break, is even on older construction, retrofitting solar is becoming a lot more common. Mm -hmm. um, anybody that's done it, you know it's a great investment, but solar panels are not cheap. No. Solar panels are going to be covered differently, kind of depending on where they're installed in your home. But let your insurance agent know if you just got a $30,000 cluster of solar panels, we need to know that because we need to increase your coverage effectively. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the big ones. Normally, um, if you're adding another room, things like that, obviously that's a little bit more invasive. We're going to need to know about that. A good rule of thumb is anytime you really do more than like hang a picture or anything like that, just give your insurance agent a call. Let them know. Um, we don't mind hearing from you. If your insurance agent minds hearing from you, there's probably some deeper issues there. Um, yeah. So yeah, I always say just reach out and let them know. Hey, I you know just put a new toilet in. I might go, okay, cool. I don't really need to know about that. Right. But thank you. Better safe than sorry. Right. But even with solar, it's not just the panels that are more expensive. It's the inverter right. that gets connected to the home. Yep. And people don't think about that. Yep. So. Yeah, there's, um, and I mean, it's it's really easy to cover. And some carriers, thankfully, have um, kind of jumped out ahead, and they even ask, it's just a standard question you have to answer on the application when you go through when the home's in California. One of the questions is, cool, they got solar panels? And if you answer yes, they immediately go, they kind of have a, a defaulted um, algorithm in there where they go, okay, cool. How many solar panels do you have? Great, that's roughly this much. We're just gonna go ahead and roll that right on into the coverages and we're gonna make sure that it's in there and it's kind of a separate line item. Mm -hmm. um, I've only seen one or two carriers that are like that. Most of them, they kind of rely on you going, oh yeah, we also have $40,000 in solar equipment. Let's make sure that's included. Yeah, well, I know you've mentioned um, you should review your policy once a year. Any changes, you should reach out to your mm -hmm. insurance broker and, and discuss that. But how often should I even update my policy? Yeah, you know, and this is, I'm sorry, this answer is super flippant, basically as needed, mm -hmm. right? So um, I always say, like, you should pull it up, you should take a look at it once a year. Just make sure when you get that renewal statement that you're going to get once a year, take a look at it, and does everything still seem about right? Do you have any questions? Is there something weird on that that you thought you got or that you thought you removed? Mm -hmm. Whatever, make sure that that's solid. Um, outside of that, again, just if you have any major life changes, like, that's a good time to take a look at all your insurance stuff, but particularly your home, if there's anything that impacts it. Um, don't necessarily shop around all the time. I mean, you certainly can every year if you feel like it. Um, mm -hmm. Rates don't generally change that drastically on home. They're right. not, it's not quite like auto. But um, yeah, just any time that you feel like something has changed. You know, maybe you bought some new property. Um, you know, you bought an expensive TV and you just want to make sure like, hey, is this covered? Go ahead and take a look at it. Call your agent. Make sure, hey, these are the life changes. Let me know if we need to make any moves. Yeah. Well, and on that note, when can I change my insurance carrier? Yeah. So... With homeowner's insurance, um, you can really change it anytime. Mm -hmm. What some folks don't understand is, let's say that you paid for the year, right? Like, let's even say you paid out of pocket. You just wrote a check to insurance company X in January. It's gonna run through until January 1 of next year because it's a 12 month policy. Mm -hmm. If March comes around and you are, your cousin starts working for insurance company Y and you go, oh, I'd really like to have my insurance company or my insurance policy with my cousin to help him out, but I'm locked into this policy. You're not locked in. You can cancel it. In California, they have to give you a prorated refund. Mm -hmm. So they basically have to take a look and go, okay, great. You were three months in. You used 25% of that. We're going to go ahead and refund you 75%. We're going to keep your coverage piece that we covered you for. After that, we're going to move on. Really, the only difference is certain uh, insurance brokers will charge you a broker fee. Where mm -hmm. They basically say, hey, for 
kind of the privilege of, you know, kind of going out there and shopping for you so that you don't have to call around 30 different companies. I'll go shop them for you. I'm going to charge you, you know, X amount for that. Mm -hmm. Broker fees generally are non-refundable. So that's kind of a one-time thing. And even if you cancel the next day, you'll get 99% of your policy, your premium back. You won't necessarily get that broker fee back. Mm -hmm. That varies a little bit company to company. Um, I don't have a ton of experience with that because I personally don't charge broker fees. Um, I feel like my job is important, but I feel like I'm fairly compensated for what I do from the insurance companies. I don't basically need to add anything on the client side. Not everybody feels that way, and that, that's not a dig against folks. I, I just let everybody know that the premium is refundable. Um, the broker fee might not be. Just ask. Yeah, and that's that's a great point because a lot of people don't realize that there are broker fees associated yep. with any changes that they make on their policy. Yep, everybody's going to handle it differently. So just ask up front, and um, they're going to have to disclose them to you. So if you're comfortable with it, cool, no harm, no foul. If not, just find somebody that doesn't charge them or you're more comfortable with their fee structure. They're out there. Yeah, awesome. Well, we're going to be right back after this short announcement. You enter this door with expired tags. Beyond is another dimension, a dimension of regulations, a dimension of long waits. You have reached the registration zone. What looks like an ordinary shop is actually Mitchell's Smog, located in the heart of the Tower District, a few minutes from the DMV. Mitchell's Smog offers your vehicle a star certified smog inspection. So remember Mitchell's Smog when you need to pass through the registration zone. The saga of Bridget and Amanda by Carol Love Forbes brings to life the struggles of historical women in early America. Find the saga of Bridget and Amanda on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and order your copy today. Hello everyone, my name is Miss G. I offer fun and affordable promotion and advertisement on my talk show. It is called Fresno Vibes. We talk, we play awesome music, I also feature a bunch of different bartenders from different places. I like to have restaurants. I like to have any event, any kind of fun stuff. Contact me at rmgmissg at gmail.com and we will have so much fun. And we will promote your business, promote your event right here on my show. So contact me. We'll have fun. Thank you. Hey, I'm Chris DeVolt. Tune in every Friday night on CentralValleyTalk.com when I bring you Sex, Drugs, Chris DeVolt, where I'll give you three guesses on what we talk about. And I also vow to bring you one live local music act a week. So tune in every week because you never know what kind of music you're going to hear right here on CentralValleyTalk.com. A dynamic litigator, in-tune listener, and forward thinker with almost a decade of experience, Nasser Nekomanish is a skilled attorney servicing clients throughout the Central Valley. When you need a lawyer, call 559-441-0114 and ask for Nasser Nekomanish. Today we bring you the first part of our global broadcast exclusive conversation. The streets of Tahrir have once again been filled. Key issues here at the United Nations Climate Change Conference remain unresolved. Police are saying the protesters to move further and further away. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now! Hi everyone, welcome back to Home Buying Tips with Allie. I'm here with my special guest, Nick Meggs of Goosehead Insurance, and we really need to touch on something that's true to everyone's hearts right now, and that's all of these crazy wildfires that yeah. California is experiencing. And so, how have the wildfires been impacting the insurance companies and the underwriters and everything? Yeah. Um, so obviously, I mean, the, the first thing that we always look at, um, you know, even down to the, the agency level is the human cost, right? Like we want to make sure that we do everything for our clients, um, to make sure that we help to get you guys in the best position possible, you know, immediately after a loss. So it kind of starts with the claims process mm -hmm. and making sure that money gets paid out as quickly as it possibly can, um, that 
even if it's not your full claim amount, like, hey, here's enough money to, you know, at least go get some food, some clothes, get in a hotel while we kind of work on the rest of it. Right. Um, now, that part being said, as far as the overall impact, and there have been quite a few refinements to the claims process with a lot of companies because we've just seen so many what we would consider catastrophic claims, you know, where we're looking at like 40 plus houses in a shot. Mm -hmm. um, being burned up and so many uh, families being displaced that a lot of companies have really simplified their claims process where they've said, hey, um, you know, maybe 20 years ago, we basically wanted a checklist of all your stuff and we're going to go through and you need to provide, you know, documentation and all that. Quite a few have basically gotten together with the Department of Insurance and said, we can't be doing this to people at this point. Um, you know, that's not to say that, like, if you have a grease fire in the kitchen, they're not going to, you know, treat that a little bit differently. Right. But, um, you know, if it is something like the Paradise Fire, right? most carriers are going to back off a little bit on the claims expectations because they're going to be understanding of exactly what's happening there. So mm -hmm. that process has changed a little bit. Now, kind of on the front end, what's changed a lot is a lot of carriers that maybe five years ago said, hey, you know, all the way up to, let's say like Shaver Lake, right? We're good up there. We're fine with that. What's happened is a lot of carriers have really kind of backed off on that and they have either completely stepped out of you know, kind of any sort of rural market, and they're really just looking at something, you know, downtown that's within a couple miles of a fire department that has a fire hydrant. Um, so they're not writing any new business there, but maybe they're letting you keep your policy. Mm -hmm. What some carriers have done is they've even non-renewed in that area. So they've basically sent something out saying, hey, you have, you know, three to six months to basically go get yourself another policy because we're just not interested in insuring in that area anymore. It's just not financially feasible. Wow. Um, now, thankfully, there is, there's always recourse for fire insurance. You can always get it. Um, you know, assuming that you actually have an insurable home, right? I mean, like, there's that piece of it. Of but um, Hindsight. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is the California Fair Plan. So that is, again, it's state-sponsored. And basically what the Fair Plan, and I, I couldn't tell you exactly what it stands for. It's F-A-I-R. What the Fair Plan does is that's going to step in and say, okay, if we've got a place that just every private carrier in California says is uninsurable from the, the fire aspect, I'm just not going to touch it. You know, it's a log cabin that's 15 miles from a fire department. There's no water around, and you basically have to helicopter in to get to it. Nobody else is going to take that risk. You can still get it insured. The way that policy works is you go through the state for the fair plan piece of it, and they say, hey, we are going to cover the following items for the following dollar amounts that you can set up mm -hmm. for the fire risk. That's basically all we're taking on. Mm -hmm. Let's say that comes out to, I don't know, 1500 bucks a year, right? right? Whatever amount it comes out to. Well, then you basically go to a private insurance carrier for the rest of that policy. Um, the technical term for it is called a policy with a differences and conditions endorsement or a DIC endorsement. Mm -hmm. What you might hear it referred to colloquially as is a wraparound policy. What the wraparound policy is going to do is that's basically, you know, one of your other insurance carriers is going to step in and say, okay, great. We have the fire risk over here. Now my company is willing to take on everything else because... You know, your home might be up by Shaver Lake, but there's not, a, there's probably less of a theft risk. You know, there's the same water claim risk that we have down here. Everything else stays the same. It's just that fire risk. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of join those two policies together. And one says, hey, we're going to take all the stuff we're okay with. Let the state of California deal with the fire risk. Um, it does tend to be a little bit more expensive than, than you would see, obviously. But it does mean that you can always get a fire policy in place. So even if you buy a home, um, you know, again, that's way out in the middle of nowhere and has no road access or anything like that. You can get a fire policy for that. Like, we're, we'll get it taken care of. It's just um, going to be a little bit trickier. So that makes me think of my next question. Mm -hmm. I guess most of us assume if we already have a homeowner's policy in place that if our house burns down, we're covered. So mm -hmm. do we need a separate fire policy? No. So... Um, at least not with any uh, insurance policy that I've ever taken a look at. Mm -hmm. um, if we're talking about, you know, the, the standard policy that almost everybody has out there, no. Um, it's actually homeowner's insurance started as fire insurance. So for most carriers, when you're kind of looking through their, like, product catalog, right, like on the producer side, if you go, okay, here's their auto, motorcycle, trailer, that's all technically considered like an auto package, right? Mm -hmm. And then everything else is going to be labeled fire. So, I mean, like, you'll even find homeowners under, like, here's their fire guidelines. Okay. So that's pretty much front and center of fire is what's, you know, kind of starts the whole thing off on your homeowner's policies. Right. Um, now, if that fire is caused by certain crazy things like, you know, an act of war, and I'm not making this up, that, that's in the documentation, yeah. but if it's caused by an act of war, an act of terrorism, that's going to be something separate and there's some different things that come into play. But, you know, if we're talking about, hey, my home is on the street and there just happened to have been, you know, a wildfire in this area and my home burned down, um, you should be covered for that. I, I can't say with 100% certainty because I don't know the exact situation, but right. yes, that is exactly what that policy is there for. So okay. you don't need a separate um, fire policy like you do flood that's kind of all bundled into your home. Really right. flood and earthquake are the two that you're going to have to look outside. Okay. 
And I know we've been talking a lot about homeowners insurance, yeah. but there's also rental property insurance that a lot of renters have access to yeah. that actually protects their belongings. So it's kind of interesting when you get into a rental dwelling, right? And so let's just say it's a home that somebody owns and you rent that place. Mm -hmm. There's really two different policies that are going to be going on there depending on which side of the fence you're on, so to speak. So for the renter, the actual tenant, you are, I highly encourage you get a renter's insurance policy. Mm -hmm. That's basically going to take some pieces of that homeowner's policy, the ones that make sense for you, right? right? It's not your home, so you're not concerned about if the home burns down, it's not technically your responsibility to replace that home, right? Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that your property is replaced. Mm -hmm. So it's going to remove the coverage A and the coverage B. Um, the dwelling and the other structures. That part's gonna come off. We're just gonna start with your coverage C, which is your stuff. Because we wanna make sure if your stuff is stolen, burned, damaged by water, whatever the scenario is, that your stuff is covered. And then it's also going to have the liability piece. So if you do something that causes that loss and the property owner comes back and sues you, there's gonna be protection there. That's why a lot of, um, even apartment complexes in Fresno require renter's insurance. Right. Because basically they wanna make sure that if you do something that leads to that building burning down and they sue you, you obviously aren't going to have, you know, a half million dollars in your pocket. Well, if you have a renter's policy with a half million dollars in liability, cool. The insurance company is going to step in, write them a check. Exactly. Now, the flip side of that is if you own the building or, you know, the home and you have a tenant, you're not really worried about their stuff. That's their responsibility, right? You're also not going to be responsible for anything that they do that causes loss or injury to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Their liability is their responsibility. The structure itself and your liability, that still stays with you. So there is a dwelling policy, and, and carriers write it differently. Um, generally, it's going to be a DP3 is what you're going to see in California. But with a DP3, we're basically saying, hey, we're just going to go ahead and we'll have a, a little bit of property coverage, that coverage C, but it's basically for your stuff that you leave there to maintain the property. It's right. so like, let's say you rent a home and you have a riding mower that you leave there and you, know, you come over and you clean the yard up because the tenant's not going to do it, right? That would be the personal property. But we're looking at, you know, generally a couple grand in personal property there. We're going to kind of issue that because... The stuff that's in the house, that's the renter's responsibility. We want to make sure that if something's wrong with the property that leads to somebody's injury and you get sued, your liability is covered. And we want to make sure that if the house burns down, that you're covered to you're replace covered, the home. Yeah. So there's kind of two policies that work together to basically do what a homeowner's policy would do. Mm -hmm. We just sort of split it in half based on the responsibility of both parties. Awesome. Well, Nick, thank you so much for being on our show Thank you today. for having me. It was great. If people want to reach out to you, what's the best contact? Yeah. So um, you can always shoot me an email. Um, I think it should pop up on the screen. It's probably behind me there, right? It yeah. Is. I mean, it's not actually, but it is on the screen. Um, so my cell phone number, 559-476-7812. Um, I answer that thing all the time. Um, yeah, if, if it's echoing, it's probably because I'm in the bathroom and I answer the phone. I, it, it's always with me. Um, you can also shoot me an email, uh, nick.megs, just my first and last name, at goosehead.com. Um, you can also just stop by our office. We are actually in the Realty One office now. Um, I lease the corner office there. Oh, nice. So, um, yeah, we are over on Ingram and Alluvial, so you can always stop by and say hi. Oh, perfect. So, oh, and my website, too, uh, www.nickmegs.com. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for this valuable information. Thank you so much today. for having me. It was great. Thank you all for watching us today. And we'll be back next week, Tuesday, with more home buying tips from Allie. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.